Another type of functional group that we frequently encounter is called an alkyl halide. These are molecules that once again look just like regular alkanes, except at least one hydrogen has been replaced with a halogen atom. The halogen atoms once again are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine. Here are the steps for naming an alkyl halide. One, find the parent chain. Two, number the substituents and write the name using the prefix fluoro, chloro, bromo, or iodo in front of the parent name. Alternatively, you can use the suffix il fluoride, il chloride, il bromide, or il iodide at the end of the parent name. Here are some examples. This molecule right here can be called, systematically, either 1-chlorohexane or hexyl chloride. Similarly, this molecule can be called chlorocyclopentane or cyclopentyl chloride. Now you'll note for this particular example that there's no number. It doesn't say 1-chlorocyclopentane or 1-cyclopentyl chloride. And the reason is because there's no ambiguity by leaving the number out. And that's one of these things that's interesting about IUPAC naming in general. If you have a name in which you can leave out numbers and it totally makes absolute sense and is not ambiguous in any way by leaving the numbers out, we often do, and it's considered correct. If, however, there is ambiguity, if you don't have the numbers in, then you have to retain them. Which brings us to a perfect problem that combines the naming of cycloalkanes with that of alkyl halides. Give the IUPAC name for the following structure. Now you'll note by looking at it that this is indeed a cyclohexane because it's a ringed structure that has six carbons in it. You'll note that it has two substituents. One is a CH3, which is a methyl group, and the other is a chlorine, which is a substituent, is called a chloro. Hence, we could call it 1-chloro-2-methylcyclohexane or 1-methyl-2-chlorocyclohexane. Which one do we call it? <laughs> Well, because there's no point of difference in the numbers going one way or the other, we are going to call it the one that gives me the lower number at the substituent that's alphabetically first, which is chlorine before methyl. Hence, the correct IUPAC name for this molecule is 1-chloro-2-methylcyclohexane. We now arrive at naming alcohols, which are molecules that look just like regular alkanes, except one or more of the hydrogens have been replaced with an OH group, which is also called a hydroxyl group. Here are the steps. Step one, find the parent chain, which is the longest carbon chain that contains the hydroxyl group. Step two, number the carbon atoms in the chain in the direction that gives the smallest number to the hydroxyl group. Number three, write the name as a single word, where we include the substituents at the beginning, followed by the parent chain. Now, whatever the parent chain's name would normally be, we replace the letter E at the end of its name with the suffix OL. Here are some examples. Assign IUPAC names to the following alcohols. As we can see here, the longest chain that contains the OH is five carbons long, with the OH being appended to carbon number two, numbering left to right. A five carbon long alkane is called pentane. Because this is an alcohol, we would remove the letter E at the end of the name pentane or replace it with the suffix OL. Hence, this molecule would be called 2 pentanol. Now you'll note that there is a CH3 also coming off of carbon 2, so we would call this molecule 2-methyl-2-pentanol. Now it's also considered correct to put the number 2 corresponding to the location of the alcohol in the middle of the name as well. Hence you could also call this molecule 2-methyl-pentan-2-ol. Now let's look over at this molecule. This is probably a little bit trickier. When we were talking about naming cyclic compounds before, we said that if you have a ringed structure that has a straight chain coming off of it, and you have to ask yourself, which one is the parent? Is it the ring or the chain? The answer is, if the ring has the same number of atoms in it as the chain, or more, then the ring is the parent and the chain is a substituent. If the chain has more, then the chain is the parent and the ring is the substituent. What do we do in this example? You'll note that the chain dangling off of the ring is shorter. It only has four carbons in it than the ring, which contains six. However, when we're naming an alcohol, alcohol is a functional group that has a higher naming priority than a ring. Hence, it now trumps the ring, and the ring is considered a substituent. This alcohol has an OH located on carbon number two if we number from right to left. This is a butanol. 
It is in fact a 2-butanol, which we can also call butan-2-all. You'll note that if this is carbon-1, this is carbon-2, and this is carbon-3, that we have a cyclohexane coming off of carbon-3. So we would call this 3-cyclohexyl 2-butanol, or 3-cyclohexyl butan-2-all. We now arrive at the naming of ethers, which are molecules that look just like regular alkanes, except one of the CH2s has been replaced with an oxygen atom. Oddly enough, there are actually two accepted methods of naming ethers. In method one, we name the two alkyl groups as substituents with the suffix ether at the end. Here are a few examples. You'll note that I've got a methyl group on one side and a propyl group on the other, so I can call this methylpropyl ether. Over here, I have an isopropyl group on one side and an ethyl group on the other. Alphabetically, I would call this ethyl isopropyl ether. And over here, I've got an ethyl group on both sides of the oxygen, so I can call this diethyl ether. In method two, we consider the longest carbon chain to be the parent chain, and then we consider the oxygen stuck to whatever carbons it's stuck to as a substituent dangling off of that carbon chain. Here are some examples. In this example, we can, rather than calling it methylpropyl ether, we can also note that the longer carbon chain between the one on the left and the one on the right is the one on the right. The one on the right is a propane. The one on the left is a methyl group, so we consider this oxygen and this methyl group to be a substituent dangling off of the propane. We call this whole substituent a methoxy group, and because it's attached to carbon one of the propane, we call it one methoxy propane. Similarly, we could note that on this particular example, the longest chain of the two, the one at the left side of the oxygen and the one at the right side of the oxygen, is the one that's on the left. It's three carbons long, so it's also a propane. We consider all of this stuff on the right to be a substituent attached to my propane. If I number this propane, one, two, three, either going from top to bottom or bottom to top, it doesn't matter. I've got my oxygen stuck to an ethyl group dangling off of carbon two. Thus, I would call this two ethoxy propane. Similarly, we would note that these two different chains are the exact same length, so it doesn't matter which one we pick. We call one of them ethane and consider the other to be a substituent appended to my ethane. Because it's an oxygen stuck to an ethyl group as a substituent, I call it an ethoxy substituent. Thus, the IUPAC approach for this molecule would be ethoxy ethane. Note that we do not have to specify a number in this particular example since it's completely non-ambiguous no matter which of the two ethane carbons I put the ethoxy group on. We now arrive at the naming of amines, which are molecules that look just like regular alkanes except one or more carbon atoms in them have been replaced with a nitrogen. Before beginning, I have to explain that amines can be either primary, secondary, or tertiary, depending on how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen. Let's take a look at these examples. The most simple amine, a nitrogen stuck to three hydrogens, is called ammonia. This amine, in which I have one carbon attached to the nitrogen, and it doesn't matter how long or branched this carbon chain is, is considered a primary amine. This is an example in which a nitrogen is stuck to two carbons. Once again, it doesn't matter how branchy these two carbon chains are or how long they are. This is considered a secondary amine. And an amine that is stuck to three carbons is called a tertiary amine. Now, just so that you know, when four carbons are stuck to a nitrogen, which can happen, the nitrogen ends up getting a positive charge. The resulting compound is called a quaternary ammonium salt as shown here, where each of these R groups represents any carbon chain, regardless of how branched or long it is. So we name primary amines by adding the suffix amine to the name of the organic substituent. Here are some examples. You'll note that this thing, when it's considered a substituent, is called a tert-butyl group. Thus, because I've got a nitrogen attached to a tert-butyl group, I would call this tert-butyl amine. This, when it's a substituent, is called cyclohexyl. Thus, this molecule would be called cyclohexylamine. When naming an amine that has two NH2s in it, that's called a diamine. To do that, I use the parent name of the alkane chain, in this case butane, and then I append numbers corresponding to which carbons in the butane the nitrogens are attached to. This molecule is thereby called butane-1,4-diamine. 
Symmetrical and secondary amines are named by adding di or tri to the alkyl group, as we can see in these examples. I've got a nitrogen that's stuck to two ethyl groups. It's called diethylamine. I've got a nitrogen stuck to three ethyl groups. It's called triethylamine. And what about asymmetrical amines? Well, asymmetrical amines are named as N-substituted primary amines, with the largest alkyl group being the parent. We can see this rule being typified by the example shown here. So here's a case where I've got a nitrogen that's stuck to two methyls and a propyl. Which of these three different hydrocarbon chains is the longest? Well, it's the propyl chain, of course. Thus, I will call this propyl amine and consider the two methyl groups to be substituents to indicate that they are attached to the nitrogen as opposed to being attached to one of the carbons in the propyl group. I write n comma n dimethylpropylamine. In this particular example, you'll note that the nitrogen is stuck to a methyl, an ethyl, and a cyclohexyl. Which of these three groups is the largest? The cyclohexyl, of course. Hence, the parent name of this molecule is cyclohexylamine. I have a methyl and an ethyl group that are considered substituents attached to the nitrogen. Because they're attached to the nitrogen, I put an N next to each of them to indicate they're attached to the nitrogen, as opposed to being attached somewhere in the ring. Thus, this molecule is called, with me placing the substituents in alphabetical order, N-ethyl-N-methyl-cyclohexylamine. So that brings us to the end of today's show. Man, we've covered a lot of ground. Please tune into our next lecture where I'll teach you about how to organize molecules according to their melting and boiling points, which is a subject that you see on standardized exams like the MCAT, the PCAT, the DAT, the GRE all the time. I'll also teach you about Newman projections and chair conformations of cyclohexane. OK, now I know that might not sound that exciting right now, but trust me, it totally will be. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.